Patrizia felt that when he lost the 50% of Gucci in a way, that was like something he did to her. You know, he should not have done that to me, she said at one point. And also she's seeing his spending. So he is restoring an antique sailing yacht. He's also uh, renovating a beautiful apartment on Costa Venezia, which is one of the main avenues. Which he's renting. He's renovating an apartment that he's renting? Yes. So the rent is already, you know, exorbitant. At this point, he has $150 million in the bank. Patrizia knows that that's it. It's a lot of money, but it's finite and he's spending it very fast. So Patrizia, as I said, came from the other side of the tracks. Her mom wanted her to marry not only for money, but for a big name. And one of her memorable quotes is, I would rather be weeping in a Rolls Royce than happy on a bicycle. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger. My guest today is Sarah Gay Forden. She is the author of House of Gucci, a sensational story of murder, madness, glamour, and greed. Yes, there is a book behind the recent star-studded film, and Sarah wrote the book, and she's going to tell us all about it. And there's a lot to tell because the book is a much more comprehensive story about Gucci history, the legacy of the company and the family, But both the book and the film culminate in the murder of Maurizio Gucci, former CEO of the company and grandson of Guccio Gucci, the founder of this legendary Italian fashion house. On March 27th, 1995, one day before I turned 26 years old, by the way, a hitman gunned Maurizio down in the foyer of his four-story Renaissance-style office and apartment building. Three initial shots drove Maurizio to his knees Then a final fatal blow into Gucci's right temple ended his fabulous life. His ex-wife Patrizia had hired the gunman because, among many other reasons, Maurizio's impending marriage meant Patrizia's alimony would be cut in half. And as you'll hear, Patrizia don't play that. Sarah Gay Forden spent years researching and writing the book, which came out over 20 years ago and finally made its way to celluloid in November 2021 in the very capable hands of director Ridley Scott. As the subtitle of the book suggests, the Gucci saga is a morality play about the sad byproducts of wealth, fame, and status. Not only does being rich and famous not necessarily make you happy, sometimes it can get you killed. This, my friends, is Sarah Gay Forden. Sarah Gay Forden, welcome to Crazy Money. Thank you for having me. Sarah, I've read The House of Gucci. I loved it. It was like discovering a treasure I didn't know existed. It's a 20-year-old book. How did you come to be writing for Women's Wear Daily in Milan in the early 90s? Oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you. I'm so glad you liked it. So I did not embark on a career as a fashion writer. I was a business reporter and I did a master's degree in economics and international affairs. And I thought that made me a very serious person. (laughs) And then I went to, I studied in Bologna, Italy, through the Johns Hopkins program and learned Italian And at that point, I was in love with everything about Italy and an Italian and decided that I wanted to be a foreign correspondent and I was going to write about Italian and European business. So I got myself to Milan. I figured no big American newspaper was going to hire Sarah and send her to Italy because she wanted to be there. So I kind of reverse engineered it. And I started first with an Italian paper and then with Dow Jones. And then I moved over to Women's Wear Daily because... It took me you know, a few moments to figure out that the big and growing business in Milan in those years was the fashion business and that readers around the world were going to be much more interested in Giorgio Armani and Gianni Versace than in the Milan Stock Exchange or, or any of the business deals we were covering at the time. Now, it's one thing to speak vacation Italian, but you were actually writing for mainstream publications in Italian? Well, initially, I was actually writing in English, but I was doing all my interviews in Italian. And one of the great things about this Hopkins program is they have a very intensive Italian language program. They go off the first foreign language that you speak. So I had studied Italian with a group of Spanish speakers. So anytime we had to sort of depart from the the class and talk about a a word or grammar or the meaning of a word, we would do it in Spanish. And so that (laughs) allowed us to kind of engage the foreign language part of our brain. I learned Italian in really a few months. So that summer, between my first and second years of grad school, I was actually in Rome as an intern for the Associated Press. And I was actually covering like G8 economic summits and the Spoleto you know, Music and Culture Festival and actually interviewing people in Italian. So it was very exciting. 
you speak Italian with a Barcelona accent. <laughs> Nobody can figure out where I'm from when I'm there. They always say, ma non sei italiana. Where are you from? I make them guess. They think I'm German or, or Austrian or Scandinavian, and they never get me as an American, which is a good thing sometimes. Yeah, you must be pulling it off quite well then. So where did the idea for the book come from? So at that point, we we're talking the late 80s, early 90s. I'm in Milan. I started covering the fashion industry for Women's Wear Daily. And the big players in those years were Giorgio Armani, who was kind of the king of beige, king of cool, and Johnny Versace, who was hot and colorful and sexy. And they were always duking it out and having kind of competing fashion shows. And Gucci was really nowhere on the map. And it was considered a has-been kind of a uh, fusty old, you know, accessories, leather goods, accessories company. And it wasn't until much later that, that Gucci became a hot commodity. But I had been dutifully covering all of the incredible events that were going on around the Gucci name. And it started out with Maurizio Gucci and his first press conference in Milan announcing he was going to turn around this overexposed, overexpanded family fashion company and bring it back to the pinnacle of the luxury goods market. And he was going to turn it into Italy's Hermes, you know, kind of on par with the French brand. And it was a fascinating story. And I wrote, I was at the press conference. I wrote about it. I interviewed him. I put all the figures and the estimates that he had spun off in this press conference into my story. Actually, I was still working for Dow Jones at the time, and it wound up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Wow. And then a few months later, I moved over to Women's Wear Daily. And everyone loves to talk to you if you work for the sort of the trade Bible. So everyone was coming out of the woodworks and telling me how everything about Maurizio's vision was going badly. And those numbers were completely made up numbers and people were leaving and the company had overspent. They were having trouble paying salaries and paying suppliers. And it was a really, really, really bad story. So, of course, I jumped on that. I mean, that was kind of the most exciting fashion business story had been on to at that point. And so I continued to report on, on what was going on with Gucci. And pretty soon Maurizio had been forced out and Bahrain Investment Bank Investcor had taken over his 50%. And then Tom Ford started hitting it out of the park with his designs. And then pretty soon they had done the most successful IPO ever and created a luxury fashion sector in the stock market. So they were, it just turned into this really incredible business story. And it wasn't until the late 90s, so maybe 97, like after the IPO and the success, you know, the newfound success of Gucci without the family, that I started thinking about, well, maybe there's a book. Oh, and meanwhile, in there, Patrizia had been, you know, he'd been murdered and Patrizia had been arrested for two years after for organizing the murder. So I started to see it. That's a key plot point right there, the murder. The murder. In fact, that's how the book starts out, as, as you know. So the funny story is about Arlington, Virginia, where I live. I had come home on vacation to visit family and I was visiting my dad, actually, and they had just opened the new Quincy Library. And he wanted me to see the library. So I walk in and one of the new things about the library, and I'm dating myself here, was that the old card catalog with its well-worn you know, <laughs> paper cards had been pushed over to the side of, of the wall. And in the middle of the research department, there was a computer. And I thought, whoa, well, let's go see what this computer can do. And I had always wanted to write a book. I think as a beat journalist, you always have that longing to see if you could dig into something that's deeper than the daily news story. But I didn't know what I was going to write about. One thing I knew was that I'm not a novelist. I deal in facts. And so I needed a fact-based story. So I walk up to the computer and I type in Gucci and it spits out the 10 blue links. And of those 10 blue links, eight of them were stories that I had written. And oh, how I thought, cool. wow, that's when the light bulb went off. I'm like, that's the book. And it's about Gucci. The movie House of Gucci premiered Thanksgiving weekend 2021. The film is said to have cost $75 million, not including marketing budgets, and has earned back twice that in theatrical sales. It debuts on streaming services, or debuted, depending upon when you're hearing this, on January 31st, 2022, which may be yesterday, if you're listening on the day that this podcast comes out. You may wonder, how did the Guccis feel about the movie? The family, that is. Well, the family issued a strongly worded opposition to the portrayal of the family and the murder. It reads in part, although the film claims to tell the true story of the family, the narrative is anything but accurate. 
depicting Aldo Gucci, president of the company for 30 years, and other members of the Gucci family as hooligans ignorant and insensitive to the world around them. It went on even more censurable. That's a great word, censurable. Your behavior is censurable is the baffling reconstruction of events that advocate leniency toward a woman who was definitively convicted as the instigator of Maurizio Gucci's murder. To see her portrayed as a victim, not only in the film, but also in statements by the cast, who is trying to survive in a male-dominated corporate culture, is an injustice and could not be further from the truth. I think you'll find the portrayal, if you do read the book, which you should, very different than how that statement depicts the portrayal in the movie and in statements by some of the members of the cast. And now back to Sarah Gay Forden. And it's a book that reads like a novel. Big parts of it read like a novel. A lot of it reads like, you know, a family history. So let's go back to that family history. Let's go back to Gucci o Gucci. Where does the Gucci brand and the company come from? So this starts out 100 years ago last year in 1921. And Gucci comes from a very modest family that has a straw hat making factory in Florence. And he's kind of trying to get away and he ends up shipping off to London where he gets a job at the Savoy Hotel. You know, they don't know from the documents exactly what job he held, but it was a low level job like a busboy or a porter or a dishwasher. But that gives him a vantage point on the European traveling elite. And he can see that they're traveling with all their beautiful clothing in this beautiful leather luggage. And that's something that he recognizes from his hometown of Florence. And that's something he knows he can do. So he goes back to Florence. And that's when he decides to open the first Gucci store in Via della Vigna in, uh, in Florence. And he has the classic entrepreneur struggle. I mean, there is times where he can't pay his bills. He's delaying payment to his suppliers until he gets payment from his customers all those kinds of things. I mean, we think about Gucci as an established brand, but in the beginning it was just as hard scrabble and bootstrapped as any other startup. Absolutely. I mean, it was not an instant success and, you know, sort of glorying in profits. I mean, he had to keep it very tight. And, you know, speaking of the money angle, he was very thrifty. He would slice the prosciutto extra thin and top off the mineral water bottles with tap water to make them last longer. (laughs) And he had to borrow money. So it wasn't an instant success. And I think it was that that initial frugality that also kind of put him in contrast within his son, Aldo, who was the expander and the marketer and the one who really wanted to make Gucci big and take Gucci abroad. And does that happen with the next generation? How does it go from Gucci to his sons and just to his sons to become a global brand? Yeah, so just to bring in an Italian expression of the saying, and, and you know, Gucci is, I think, emblematic in many ways of many other family companies, of course, none with as dramatic a storyline as this one. But the saying is the first generation creates, the second generation expands, and the third generation destroys. <laughs> and it was almost, it was almost, you know, true in this case, although they managed just to save it. The company ended up being controlled by two of Gucci's sons, Aldo and Rodolfo. And Aldo was really kind of the genius. He used to say, you know, my family is like a train and I am the engine and they are the caboose. You know, he was the driving force. And he instantly saw that after the war, there were many American servicemen in Rome, for example. And he had pushed his father to open their first store in Rome outside of Florence. They were buying leather goods and trinkets and wallets and little things that they could take back to their families and friends. And so he said, well, why do we have to wait for the Americans to come to Rome? Why can't we go to the Americans? And that's when he started the push to open the first store in New York. And this was very early days. You know, this was in the 50s. This was before, you know, their Madison Avenue was like the designer brand avenue. What brands were there? What was high fashion in the early 50s in in the United States? It was French. It was all French. It was, you know, it was Dior and it was Yves Saint Laurent. And I mean, they were just kind of getting started then. It was Chanel. I think Chanel was one of the first. The Gucci product line at this time is just bags and it's not even shoes yet, is it? Or They started the shoes a little bit later. Yeah. In like late 50s. No haute couture, no... No ready to wear. In right, fact, right, that was right. all the tension with Paolo that comes out. But the only other Italian brand in New York at the time was Pucci, which was known for the very colorful kind of graphic print. So it was Gucci and Pucci. So people who were into fashion were were aware of that. But otherwise, it was all French. So Aldo is the expander. He's the visionary. What is Rodolfo doing during these years? 
And Rodolfo is in Milan. He actually didn't even want to be in the family business in the beginning. He wanted to be an actor and he was passionate about acting. And he had gone to Rome and done some deliveries, you know, on set in Cina Cita. I mean, Rome was really the heart of filmmaking in those years. And he actually started getting roles as a silent actor, you know, in the early silent films. But his problem was he didn't make the cut when the silent film switched over to talkies and his star, you know, was on the decline. And so he came back into the family company and he was established in Milan and he really oversaw the Milan store and some of the designs for the, they all designed the handbags. So he would go down to Florence and work in the craft shop and artisan shop and He uh, particularly liked to design the clasps, like the more like elaborate clasps of some of the bags. Those are the saddle motifs or the double G's. What what were the clasps that they had that were signature? I mean, there were different, different styles. I mean, yes, the double G became the signature, but there's a great story about that because again, that was one of Aldo's, you know, brainchilds. And before the double G, they had a fabric that was on the sort of early trunks and suitcases that they made. And it was a hemp fabric with like a beige, you know, background with intersecting brown diamonds. The beauty of this fabric was that you could turn it any way as you were putting it onto this onto the suitcase or onto the piece, and it looked the same. You didn't you could save more fabric that way. So again, frugality is <laughs> part of design. Perfect. And actually, I had the opportunity to be in Florence in uh, last September, and I got a personal tour of the archive, which they were just starting to put together when I was working on the book and I worked with the archivist in reporting the book. And now they fill this whole palazzo, which was, it was the artisan workshop before they built their new factory, new factory in the seventies. And that whole building now is filled with products from Gucci over the years. And it's really fascinating to see it all together. That must be super cool. I would love to see that. When did Gucci become this fabulous brand worn by Jackie O and Princess Grace and people like that. Yeah, I mean, it, it had an initial, uh, I think, sort of star quality even in, in the 50s. And, you know, we see early photos of Isabella Rossellini wearing Gucci, carrying Gucci. But it was really the 70s, you know, and it was Jackie, it was Sophia Loren, it was Sammy Davis Jr. You know, he, you know at that point, Aldo had also opened the first shop on Rodeo Drive. And and again, that shows his marketing genius because Rodeo Drive was still like a dirt track back in the day. And he identified it as a key location. And then Gucci became the anchor for many other luxury brands. And they had a pair of of white leather couches that they had made for the store that were part of the store display. And Sammy Davis loved those couches and bought them for himself. That away, Sammy. Aldo has three sons, correct? That's right. I'm turning in my book to the family tree. I turned back to this graph. I guess you can't see it here. Several times while you read it, because you got to remember whose kid is who, right? Yeah. Aldo's got three sons, Giorgio, Paolo, Roberto. And for our Italian uh, listeners, please, I apologize for my pronunciation. That was pretty good. Oh, thank you. And Rodolfo (laughs) marries an actress that he worked with and has one son, Maurizio. And that is actually the sort of the genesis of much of the imbalance and conflict that comes later. So Maurizio grows up as an only child. Tragically, his mother dies very early. He's only five when she dies. So he grows up in this austere house with this very reserved father, Rodolfo, who loves him, but is very kind of aloof and and distant. So Maurizio pretty much grows up with nannies and his driver, uh, Luigi, who follows him everywhere. And, And you see this kind of menacing appearing figure in the film, you know, the car, the driver and the black glasses. And then you realize later that he's actually a caring figure because he smiles. Well, Luigi was really his constant companion. And even in the article that I wrote in November, um, right before the movie came out about the secret girlfriend that Maurizio had, you know, Luigi was everywhere. He was on the boat with them. He was helping them. They went on a motorcycle ride. I know I'm jumping forward here, but it's just such a great relationship. When they go on this motorcycle ride in, in uh, Sardinia and Porto Cervo, Uh, Maurizio can't turn the motorcycle around. So Luigi follows them in the car. And then when it's time to turn around, he turns the motorcycle around. So Maurizio doesn't fall over with Sherry. So one of the people that I was most pleased to be able to interview towards really towards the end of my research on the book was Luigi, because he was actually, I believe, the person who knew Maurizio better than anyone. So Maurizio grows up 
in his father's, both in his shadow, but also with his father looming over him, his father would make him stay at dinner, the very formal dinners they would have at their house by themselves until he finished. So he was really kind of a stunted child, socially speaking. And he's got three cousins on the other side. How does the business develop in this next generation? What role does each of them play? So on the other side, he has Paolo, who is kind of the most disruptive cousin, who's the, who's the creative uh, guy. He does run around town in corduroy suits. He fancies himself a designer. He has the vision of adding a ready-to-wear line to the Gucci line, which is the correct vision. But uh, there was a lot of disagreement over whether he was the one, one to do it, right? And then Giorgio, who um, was the oldest, was in Rome, and he pretty much managed the Rome store and he even actually started his own line on the side. That was also part of the drama as, you know, every Gucci seemed to want to do their own thing. And then Roberto was in Florence and he kind of oversaw the factory and managed the Florence shop. But as Maurizio comes of age, his father and he come to loggerheads over the woman he's dating. Why did Rodolfo not like Patrizia? Patrizia is really viewed in the, the Milanese social circle as kind of a girl from the other side of the tracks. And one of the things I tried to convey in the book, which people might not realize about Italy and about Milan in particular, was that Milan was kind of ruled by this very old world industrial elite. And it was old money and it was old school and it was all about appearances. And there were, you know, this isn't like the Bella Vita Italy. This was very scripted and you could only go to certain places, only see certain people, only wear certain things. There wasn't, you know, it wasn't as articulated as a caste system in India, but there were definitely social rules and social strata. And so she was not considered at the same level as the Gucci's. And I should add, even the fashion, you know, moguls who are starting to come up in that era were not considered on par with the older industrial elites, so like the Pirellis and the Agnellis and the De Benedettis. And not, not all of them were in Milan, but they did dominate Milan as well because that's where the stock market was and that's where the center of business was. So for Maurizio to want to kind of cross over with Patrizia, that was just anathema to his father. And, and the, his father was petrified that Maurizio was basically going to be taken for his money. And that's not what he wanted for his son. I kept going, knowing how the story ended, I couldn't decide if I had known Patrizia earlier that I would have thought that she was Maurizio's biggest advocate. Was she only an advocate for him because the more status he had, the more status she had by association? Well, definitely. She wanted him to be the big you know, fashion CEO in Milan, and she pushed him. But that's also because she wanted to be associated with that. I mean, that's what she wanted for herself. You know, her mom had been pushing her not only to marry a wealthy man, but a man with a big name. And as I had said earlier, I mean, Gucci wasn't really a big name. He wasn't out there in the sort of Milan fashion social circuit. And she was pushing him from behind to kind of get in front of all of that. So they get married without Rodolfo in attendance. Eventually, Rodolfo makes up with Maurizio and brings him back into the business where he comes back into the business. In the meantime, there's lots of drama in the family about who's going to take control. Can you share a couple of the anecdotes from this wild time in the Gucci saga? I mean, it's just, you couldn't make this story up. There's so many uh, twists and turns and surprising moments. I mean, there were family product meetings where they all go to Florence. At this point, they're in the new factory in Scandici, which is more modern, built in the 70s. And the next morning, the, the night watchman comes in and he sees that the, all the windows are open and there's handbags like littered in the grass, you know, <laughs> around the factory. And he thinks, oh, my God, there's been a break in. And he goes running in and he realizes, no, there was no break in. There had been a family product meeting the night before and they had disagreed and there was, you know, throwing handbags at each other. And some of them were flying out of the window. Another meeting where Aldo throws an ashtray crystal ashtray at Paolo. He's so angry at him and it smashes against the wall and smashes into thousands of pieces. You know, really kind of shocking stuff. There's a famous board meeting where Paolo has figured out that Aldo is siphoning money out of the company into offshore accounts. And he's trying to get a grasp on what is actually happening. And there's a family board meeting in Via Tornaboni over the store in Florence. And Paolo shows up with a tape recorder and he wants to tape record the minutes and he's asking his father, you know, very probing questions about 
where the profits are going. And the father's not having it at all. And he reaches to grab the tape recorder. There's a kerfuffle and somebody has him in a neck hold. He gets cut by the tape recorder and he runs out of the building, you know, dabbing at his, his face with his handkerchief, calling for his lawyer. Well, there happens to be a paparazzo outside who snaps his picture and the next day it's all over the papers. So, you know, whereas many family squabbles would take place behind closed doors in the case of the Gucci's, they burst out, you know, into the public forum. And Paolo was dramatic, but he wasn't wrong. I mean, they weren't exactly handling company finances according to generally accepted accounting principles, right? I mean, he wasn't wrong. And in fact, at that point, De Sole is already in the picture. And De Sole is the character who you see in the movie, but, you know, also in the book, he has the longest arc of time in the story. And he was at many of those meetings because he started as Rodolfo's personal lawyer because Rodolfo wanted someone to take his side when all the shenanigans started happening. And De Sole was the one who warned Aldo, first of all, that he can't play around with the IRS and that he has to pay his taxes and the Americans aren't going to just close an eye. And I think this brings up also an interesting idea, again, when you talk about money and people's relationship to money. Aldo felt that he was Gucci and that he had made Gucci as profitable as it was and so that he felt justified in taking extra money because he felt he had put in more. And he also felt like he didn't, in Italy, at least at the time, I think the financial police have have certainly upped their game. But at the time, people didn't trust the state. They thought it was overspent on things they didn't want. And they didn't really think it was fair to pay taxes. And so if you paid all the taxes that you owed, you were considered kind of dumb. And so the real challenge was to figure out how to avoid paying taxes. And so there was this kind of cultural attitude towards taxes and De Sol is trying to explain to Aldo, it's not that way in the U.S. You can't just do the same thing there. And Aldo's just like, oh, you know, leave me alone. Don't talk to me. And then, you know, we see what happens. He ends up as an old elderly man having to go to jail in the U.S. for tax evasion. So where is Gucci today? Well, 100 years later, the modest family-owned leather shop started by Guccio Gucci in Florence in 1921 exists as a very different beast. Today, Gucci operates as a subsidiary of the French luxury group Caring, which also owns Balenciaga, Alexander McQueen, Bottega Veneta, Saint Laurent, and other fashion brands. As of 2019, Gucci operated 487 stores worldwide, had over 17,000 employees, and generated about $10 billion from sales of its handbags, shoes, jewelry, watches, beauty, and ready-to-wear clothing and accessories. If the lines outside the Gucci store at Phipps Plaza here in Atlanta are any indication, people still cannot get enough of this iconic brand. And if you want to get me a nice gift, I am partial to Gucci's Tiger Men's Ace sneaker. I wear a size 12 US and they're only $750 or $375 per shoe. Now, meanwhile, he sees that he has three sons and Rodolfo has one son. So he knows that the next generation isn't going to be controlled necessarily by any one of his offspring. And Paolo is kind of the black sheep. He's pushing for, you know, all these different things. And he's kind of pushed out of the business as well. How does Maurizio eventually become the CEO of the company? And and how does Rodolfo feel about, does Rodolfo have the confidence in his son that he is up to the task? Well, I mean, this happens long after Rodolfo dies and leaves Maurizio, his 50%. And at that point, Maurizio realizes that it's up to him to figure out how is he going to channel the future direction of the company? And Rodolfo didn't really trust him. And as you pointed out earlier, he never really gave him the tools. He never really brought him into the business. There's a couple of scenes in my book where he asks both De Sole and another lawyer, Alan Tuttle, to kind of take care of his boy, you know, and help him make good decisions. So you can see that Rodolfo has zero confidence in Maurizio. But at the same time, Maurizio is filled with this sense of mission that he needs to prove to his father and his uncle that he can make Gucci great again. And he embarks on this plan to turn Gucci into the Italian Hermes. And he's trying to work through it with his cousins at that point. Alto really believed in the family, even though he ran it kind of as an autocrat. And he had given more and more of his shares to his sons over the years. So so the shareholding was was diluted. And Maurizio wasn't able to get them on board with his plan. And and one of the reasons was, you know, the Gucci name was very lucrative for all of them. And they were able to license 
everyone was kind of doing their own licensing deals on the side. So I remember Roberto and Florence had a licensed scotch because he liked scotch. So uh, there were, you know, coffee mugs, there were desk blotters and sets. I mean, there were all the most random products. And in those years, Gucci was more associated with kind of the plastic GG toilet kits that you could see like on sale in Filene's basement. So it was not a quality product. It was recognizable and it was profitable, but it was not a quality product. The licensing had taken it down market. Very down market. And, and at that point, Maurizio was kind of up against his cousins and his uncle who were very happy with the status quo because they were, you know, they were lining their pockets. But he had this, what he felt was like a higher, higher mission. So he's got a vision of quality in return to the Gucci of old. And yet he also has no discipline from a spending perspective, either from a personal or from a corporate perspective. And he's out there, he's buying yachts and putting tens or hundreds of millions of dollars into palazzos and estates in Switzerland and things like that, while he also is trying to push a vision through, but he hasn't kept his powder dry to make it a reality. And that's really his lack of financial management is actually his real Achilles heel in this story. And I actually was drawn to write the book because of Maurizio, because I had observed and covering the Italian fashion industry, but also other industries that for an entrepreneur to have a very clear vision is probably one of the most important things that you can have if you're going to make something of your brand. And so he had this vision, which was the correct one, and it was an ambitious one, but he was moving towards it. And he'd done a lot. He hired Don Mello, who had been the president of Bergdorf Goodman, who in turn brought in Tom Ford. He had really, like, really turned the ship. Um, but what caught him up was that he, he didn't know how to balance the spending and he was getting the company into debt. He was getting himself into personal debt. And there were a lot of shenanigans about that too. There was a a crazy story where Investcore at this point, and again, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but this is after he's bought out the cousins and the uncle, he's brought in the financial partner. And all these are actually radical things for a family company to be doing. So, so in many ways you've got to see Gucci and Maurizio, even in his, you know, with his flaws, was a pioneer. I mean, this was kind of the first effort to get to the next level. He had racked up so much personal debt that finally Inviscor thought they had leverage over him. They were going to be able to get him out. And at the last minute, he came up with something like $30 million and was able to pay off the debt and get the liens off his 50% and blew them away. And then he tells this story because they asked him, well, where did you get the money? Because nobody could figure it out. And he tells them the story about how he'd had a dream and his father had come to him in the dream and told him to look under the floorboards of the chalet in St. Moritz. And he did. And there was, you know, $30 million. So they knew he was pulling their leg, but he wasn't going to tell them where he got the money. There's no shortage of shenanigans in this story. That's for sure. And with the source of that money was a very irreputable Italian who was basically on the lam in Japan, right? Very interesting character, uh, Delfo Zorzi, who had made a fortune in the resale business of the kind of the old designer stock. You got your season before in the store and you haven't sold it. You've got to get rid of it. They sold it into Japan. But he was also involved in a bombing in the earlier years of terror in Italy when um, when the Red Brigades and others were you know blowing up train stations and things. And there was a bombing in Milan and Piazza Fontana which was actually right where my offices were subsequently. So he was kind of an interesting, unexpected figure in the Gucci story. Now, Rodolfo had warned Patrizia while he was alive that when Maurizio became CEO and had the money and the title that he would change. And indeed, after he became CEO, he divorced or he left his family. He left his wife and his children. And she's not a happy camper about all this. I thought it was really fascinating that Rodolfo actually had, was so prescient about his son, who he didn't really you know, believe in, <laughs> right. somehow had nailed what was going to happen to him. And Maurizio became kind of the Italian equivalent of the henpecked husband. And he realized he had married Patrizia almost in an act of rebellion to get out from under the thumb of his father and the shadow of his father. But, you know, they say we marry our parents or one of our parents. And in a way, he married his father. And then as he you know, grew more powerful and got this idea to turn around Gucci. He felt constrained by her and she was very critical of him. And she had already 
seen his shortcomings and wasn't hesitating to tell him what she thought they were. So he left at that point. He had, well, you know, as we find out in November last fall, when I wrote the story, he had actually met Sherry McLaughlin, who was an American former model who was an expert sailor. And he was in Sardinia working with the boats that were preparing for the America's cup. And he was actually sponsoring Italia, which was the Italian entrant. And he had created a whole line of equipment and a uniform and clothes. And he'd set up like a base camp in Porto Cervo. And so that's where he met Sherry. And he realized that it was possible to have a different kind of relationship. And she was very open and very free and not trying to own him and not trying to tell him what to do. Except she taught him how to sail because he didn't know anything about sailing. So all the while he's conducting or he's trying to bring his vision for Gucci to fruition, there's lots of, there's massive cash flow issues. Investcor, which is the partner he brought in to help buy out his cousins, eventually buys him out. The struggle is long and very detailed, but the net of it is that he runs out of money and can't get it over the finish line. Yeah. And at that point, he really has his back up against the wall in a way, just as as Aldo, you know, before him was forced out the door because his sons had already capitulated and sold their shares. So he he had no no recourse. At that point, Maurizio has to capitulate. And there's actually a key vote. There's a board meeting and Domenico de Sole votes against him. And that's the last straw that forces him out. And Domenico always said he felt that he had to do what was right for the company and to save the company. He saw that Maurizio wasn't going to be able to do it. And it's a crushing blow to Maurizio. And yet he had been given every opportunity to try to right the ship and he couldn't do it. And after he's pushed out, he still has a lot of money left, still has lots of beautiful properties. And he's trying to live life on his own terms, move forward with a new woman that he loves. And Patrizia isn't having it. Patrizia is furious. And she, Patrizia felt that when he lost the 50% of Gucci in a way that was like something he did to her. She very much (laughs) internalized that, you know, he should not have done that to me. She said at one point, and also she's seeing his spending. So he is restoring a antique, a historic sailing yacht called the Creole three wooden masts, dozens of sails. And he's restoring it like with the top of the line restoration, it's costing millions of dollars. Sherry estimated it was probably like $25 million in this boat. And he's also uh, renovating a beautiful apartment on Costa Venezia, which is one of the main avenues in Milan that goes into the, the shopping center area. Which he's renting. He's renovating an apartment that he's renting? Yes. <laughs> so the rent is already, you know, exorbitant. And then he's doing things like putting in like, you know, parquet floors that have been like hand cut. I mean, really, again top of the line. And he has, at this point, he has $150 million in the bank. And Patrizia knows that that's it. I mean, it's a lot of money, but it's finite and he's spending it very fast. And so she's very concerned and he's going, you know, around with Paola sort of right under her nose and it's too much for her to bear. And this is Patrizia. This is a woman whose wonderful quote, what did she say about the Rolls Royce? So Patrizia, as I said, came from the other side of the tracks Her mom wanted her to marry not only for money, but for a big name. And one of her memorable quotes is, I would rather be weeping in a Rolls Royce than happy on a bicycle. Wow. This was around when she was complaining about the divorce agreement being too too shabby. Wow. So they finally get divorced. Maurizio left her in 1985, but they don't actually get divorced until 91. And that's in part because under Italian law at that time, because it's, you know, a Catholic country ruled by the Vatican, you had to go through a a seven year separation period before you could get a divorce. They've since shortened that. (laughs) Good decision. I think, (laughs) uh, cutting to the chase and anybody who's seen the trailer for the film knows that Patrizia hires a hitman and has Maurizio killed. The coldness of the way she goes about this is amazing. And, the only spoiler I'll do is this. She has him killed and then moves into his apartment, sleeps in his bed and wears his bathrobe. I mean, that is, that is a whole other level of cold-blooded. Patrizia Martinelli was born in 1948 and raised by a single mother. When Patrizia was 12, her mom married Ferdinando Reggiani, a wealthy businessman who adopted Patrizia. 
Patrizia met Maurizio Gucci at a party in 1970 when she was 22 years old and they started dating. Rodolfo, Maurizio's father, objected so vehemently to their relationship that Maurizio moved out of his father's home and lived in the Reggiani home under Ferdinando's watchful eye. Maurizio and Patrizia eventually married and moved to New York. Despite his reservations about the union, Rodolfo gave the couple a luxury penthouse in New York, where Patrizia became active in social circles, attending parties and becoming friends with the likes of Jackie Kennedy Onassis. The couple had two daughters while living in New York, then moved back to Milan in 1982. In 1985, Gucci left Patrizia, but they didn't officially get divorced for many years. As part of that eventual divorce settlement, Gucci agreed to pay Patrizia an annual alimony of $1.47 million. Though she was no longer allowed to use the Gucci surname, she continued to do so anyway, stating, I still feel like a Gucci, in fact, the most Gucci of them all. What a perfect Patrizia quote. And after that, well, you know what happened. And her daughters stay by her side this whole time. Her daughters were very loyal to her. And she maintained that she never she never did this. She was going around Milan publicly asking people randomly if they would kill her husband, her ex-husband. And then she was saying this at dinner parties. And it was so disturbing to her lawyer at one point that he wrote her like a cease and desist letter and told her she had to stop saying that. But then when it actually happened, she admitted, she said, yes, I went around and said that, but I never actually intended for anyone to do it. And she accused her friend Pina Uriema, who was who was nicknamed the Black Witch, of taking it, you know, the initiative and doing it and then blackmailing her for the money. So they were very sort of hotly contested, you know, the real sort of story about how this murder came to pass. And they finally bust her based on an informant and the trial goes down and they convict her and the Black Widow and the Trigger Man and she goes to jail. How long was she in jail? So she was sentenced to initially 29 years in jail, which made the chief detective on the case absolutely explode with anger because he always felt that she should have had a life sentence on par with the killer. Mm. Um, But the judge said the reason he gave her a lesser sentence was because she had he had ordered a psychological evaluation of Patricia and they found that she had a narcissistic personality disorder which basically meant that as long as life was going well, she was fine. But when things started going against her, she harbored, you know, deep rancor and felt mortally wounded and then became kind of obsessive about the things that had happened. Isn't so, that all of us, though? Isn't that, that, <laughs> that's, that sounds familiar to me. <laughs> I'm great when things Better are watch good. Out. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> So you spent a lot, I mean, this is a 500 page book, which reads much more quickly than it sounds. And you spent years in the heads of these people. What does it, what does it make you think about the nature of wealth and successful people, but not just successful people, but people with a high degree of status and public profile? I thought I was just going to knock this book off and I did my 12 (laughs) chapter outline and I was like, okay, I can just write a chapter a month. I'm going to get it done in a year. Well, it ended up taking almost two years. It was actually 18 months of researching and writing. And then the last six months were, were editing. But what I realized, and I don't know if this is my only book so far, so I don't know if this is true for every book, but I had to completely get lost in the characters, as you said, and, and really kind of internalize them and try to, and also because each one was kind of, you know, diametrically opposed to the others. And so I couldn't just accept one person's version of the truth. I had to figure out that the truth was going to be somewhere in the middle. And and everybody had, on the one hand, you know, sort of the right to their own perceptions about things. But, you know, as one interviewer pointed out to me, they were all very good at identifying the flaws in the others, but maybe not in themselves. So, yeah, I, lo- I kind of got lost. And that's why I dedicated the book to my daughter, Julia, because she was three when I started writing it. And I wanted her to know why her mom was so distracted <laughs> when she was running around as a toddler. But I think, you know, the moral of the story is obviously money doesn't bring happiness and maybe be careful of what you wish for. And, you know, really how the allure of Gucci actually even though they built this incredible brand that has had all these re- rebirths and is, is still going strong today, you know, under completely different crew and different scenario, it actually brought out the worst in the family in many ways because everybody wanted like the peace for themselves 
whereas the non-family members were able to collaborate. So you see this incredible collaboration, which is still going strong today between Tom Ford and Domenico De Sole, and they're now working on Tom Ford's brand. But they were indivisible and they ruled that company also, you know, very strongly, but they were they were completely aligned and they found that they worked out, you know, who was going to do what and what their roles were, but they were unshakable. Not that they didn't butt heads along the way. Tom was the designer and DeSole was the CEO, correct? And I mean, they each had their lanes and they respected the other's talent and drive and autonomy in those positions. Exactly. And the butting heads was part of their working out, you know, what was Tom's role going to be and what was Domenico's role going to be? And they basically worked out, Tom said, I'm going to, you know, I'll take care of the product and the image and you take care of the money, you know, the budgets and the factories and the production. And that's how they worked it out. And there is still always going to be tension, you know, with those roles, because obviously the manager is going to try to rein in costs and the designer may want to, you know, blow them out. But they had a, a level of loyalty that I think was really unparalleled in the industry and became a model for many, many companies and is still in a way a model for for the relationship today between the designer Alessandro Michele and the CEO Marco Bizzari. They have a real kind of, it's almost a symbiotic kind of a relationship. You know, as I'm reading the book, I'm thinking about the difference in popular culture, political mores, relative zeitgeists at the time from the 50s to the 70s to today. You know, in a world where there's so much focus on economic inequality, animal rights, respect for the individual human being, where does high-end fashion sit in our culture today? Very good question. I mean, in a way, it's a way of telling stories and also uh, perceiving what people dream about. They have to come up with ways to sell people things they don't need, you know, bag, bags and <laughs> shoes and, yeah. and clothes. And so what's fascinating to me is how these brands figure out a way to make people dream. And so whether you have the money and you just can easily afford these products or whether there's so many stories through history of like women, you know, skipping lunch to save that money to be able to buy like the Jackie handbag. Okay. So, you know, and even in the beginning of, of the movie, you hear the Gaga voiceover, you know, you think one day, maybe one day you'll have enough money to buy mm. one of these pieces. Maybe you won't. So it's something about the allure of how the other people live. And also if I have this product, will that make me, will that transform me somehow into this fabulous person and give me this fabulous life? I was thinking about it during the holidays when I was reading the book. I saw a clip from the movie The Family Man with Nicolas Cage and Taya Leone where he is an investment banker and then hits his head or something or goes, goes back into the alternative universe where he is a tire salesman in suburban New Jersey. And one day they go to the mall and he puts on a Zania suit. And he's looking at himself in the mirror and he says something to the effect of this suit makes me a better person. And I was like, I remember that. I remember the first time I was in Saks or Bergdorf as a young professional in New York and I put on a Zania suit that I could actually afford. And I was like, holy shit, I am buying this suit because it, it represents who I am for my aspirational self. And so when I saw that movie, I was like, that's the greatest line ever been written. It's exactly that. That's it. I think you encapsulated it. It takes you to a different level and it, it makes you, it gives you a different sense of possibility about yourself, I think. So, you know, in a way we can set it off against all the like really serious social issues that we're dealing with. But it's also, I think about how people kind of galvanize themselves and move forward. And actually, I'm glad that you mentioned Xenia because I covered that family and that business. And that was one family that I've got to say, if I, if I could hold up an example of a family where, you know, everybody really worked together and, and sure they had cousins and they had conflicts, but the ability at all levels from the founder to the second generation to the third generation was pretty amazing how they were successful in contrast to the Gucci story. And they make beautiful clothes. And they make well. beautiful clothes. <laughs> Why did it take 20 years for the book to become a movie? Well, first of all, I mean, I'm not a Hollywood creature, but people tell me these things take time and it's really a, <laughs> about getting the right cocktail of talent. But in particular, right after the book came out, 
uh, Martin Scorsese came out and said that he was going to do a Gucci movie, but that he didn't want my book. He had optioned an older book by a British journalist, which I actually re-reported for my book because it was all based on interviews with Paolo. So it was, again, very you know one sided. But that killed the market for anybody else to be interested in doing a Gucci movie because no one was going to go against Scorsese. And then he didn't do the movie. And a few years later, Janina, Ridley Scott's wife, started talking about how Ridley Scott was going to do a Gucci movie. And they had ties with the family and they had hired a number of screenplay writers. And so the, the second important piece, and Ridley Scott says this in the initial rollout of the movie, they did a panel and he said, you know, for a director, the absolutely essential thing to have a great movie is to have a great screenplay. And the screenplay is the roadmap for the movie. And it wasn't until I think it was 2018 that they attached a new screenplay writer, Roberto Bentivegna, who's a young Italian, very talented writer. And they actually asked me to, to work with him as he worked on the screenplay. So I consulted on the screenplay and he really got it. And I didn't work with any, the other screenplay writers or see there were two previous screenplays. I didn't, I wasn't involved at all at that point. And he had grown up in Milan, like my daughter, he had gone to a British Italian high school. He knew the scene of sort of Milan in those days. And his mother worked for Armani. So he knew the fashion industry. He really got what the story was about. Was it hard to not get your hopes up too high while you're working on the screenplay? Because you never know what's going to happen with a screenplay, right? I tried to just enjoy the process and I really enjoyed the conversations with him. And he was really taking a deep dive into the characters and their motivations. And that was very heartening to me because I'd spent so much of my blood, sweat and tears, you know, trying to figure these people out. It was kind of cool that somebody else was trying to do it too. Well, as I've said many times, I love the book and I learned so much that I hadn't even ever thought about, didn't even know about. And I'm so pleased that the film brought your hard work back up to the surface and to the awareness of people like me. Before we go, I want to kind of close with a quote from Rodolfo Gucci, who said that fits with very much the theme of this show. Every human creature has three essentials that must work in harmony, a brain, a heart, and a wallet. If these three elements do not work together, problems will come. So, my friends, please make sure to think about your brain, your heart, and your wallet always being in harmony. Sergey Ford, and thank you so much for joining. Again, the book is The House of Gucci. The movie will be streaming on your favorite streaming apps as of January 31st. And before you watch it, you got to read the book. Sarah, thank you so much for joining. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me and your great questions. Well, it's a fascinating story and a great book. Uh, I tore through this 500-page book, as you heard me say. And there is plenty of, as this subtitle alludes to, murder, madness, glamour, and greed. But there's also a lot of really hardcore business history and family interpersonal dynamics and insights into, well, how would you pass down a company like this to subsequent generations? We're fascinated by this topic. Apparently we are because, you know, one of the most popular TV shows on right now is Succession, which is all about siblings fighting for control over dad's company. And there's tons of that in House of Gucci as well. As I mentioned, the film is now available for streaming on the major streaming services, but read this book. It's worth your time. Let's get to the takeaways. Obviously, money won't make you happy, period. I don't care how much you got. It and of itself will not make you happy. Sure, more is better than none, but just its presence isn't going to change whatever misery you see in the mirror or unhappiness you have at home. That is a completely different issue. Related, takeaway number two, people who look like they have it all don't have it all. I've been in enough fancy rooms with fancy people to tell you that they're human beings, and I don't care what their last name is. I don't care if their name is stitched on your tie or on your shoes. They still have the same doubts and desires and hopes and dreams and fears that every single one of the rest of us dirty, imperfect human beings walking around this planet have. Don't let it fool you. And there couldn't be a better example of this than the Gucci family, because not only did they have tons and tons of dough and houses in San Moritz and yachts and all that kind of stuff, but they had the name, which is as fancy a name as Western society has ever known, a brand so aspirationally pure that people still stand in line to this day to get these products, to have you know any of the latest manifestations of their handbags, shoes, 
and accessories. So people who look like they have it all don't have it all. Lastly, despite knowing all that, despite my empirical knowledge that money won't make me happy and that appearances don't really matter, I still, this, reading this book made me want to buy a lot of nice new clothes. I mean, I dress, I'm wearing an old college t-shirt right now and some of my Air Force Ones right now. And I don't have a lot of fancy places. If I showed up at the Laughing Skull Lounge dressed in a new Gucci suit, I would be laughed out of the establishment. But I still kind of miss dressing up and going to ad industry functions, looking all swank in my cool Gucci attire or Xenia attire or Burberry attire, whatever it was. I don't know. I still get that. I get that logic. I'm not sure not sure where it's going to fit in the rest of my life, but I don't think I'm done with Gucci. Does that make me a hypocrite? I don't know. Maybe I'm a hypocrite. The stuff is nice, though. Real, real nice. Thank you, Gucci or Gucci, for starting what you started. Craftsmanship matters. All right, that's it for this week. In the meantime, I hope you take good care of yourself and Mike Carano make me sound smart. <laughs>